Hello, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you some theory and practice for tackling complex societal and environmental problems. What I'm going to cover today are what are complex societal and environmental problems and what characterises them, who deals with them and where do inter and transdisciplinarity fit, a useful framework that I've developed, Integration and Implementation Sciences or I2S, a useful resource that I curate, the Integration and Implementation Insights blog and repository, and some ideas about building community. And I hope that it's a community that you'll be inspired to join. So let's start by thinking about some complex societal and environmental problems. And I'd like you to take about 10 seconds now to either write down on pen and paper or on your mobile phones or whatever else you have handy. Think about the sort of problems that you think about when you think about complex societal and environmental problems. So what did you come up with? I've come up with things like organised crime and pandemics and boat people and scams and financial market crashes and a whole range of things that confront us in our societies. These are the sorts of problems that I'm thinking about and that I invite you to join me in thinking about today. So let me take, ask you to take another 10 seconds or so to think about what it is that these problems have in common. What is it that makes a problem complex and the kind of problems that we're thinking about? So I suggest that they've got two things in common. One is that they can't be defined in a way that everyone would agree with. So nobody is no unified agreement on gun control, for example. People have got different ideas on what that means. And there are also problems that can't be solved, although there are things that we can do that are better than other things. So there's no way of getting rid of climate change, but there are things that we can do to make the impacts much less than they are, uh, are going to be otherwise. So let's think a bit more about who deals with complex problems. Um, so some time ago, I produced this little uh, word cloud of some of the major groups. Um, we're here today to talk about inter and transdisciplinarity, but it's also important to know that there are other groups of people who think about this, people in systems thinking or complexity science or action research or post-normal science or design science. Also, parts of it are thought about by people in implementation science or the decision sciences and policy sciences. And there's even something called the science of team science. And then you've got a whole bunch of people in projects who might not use any of those labels or they might use the labels but not belong formally to any of those communities. So what we're talking about is a whole range of different um, frameworks that have been developed for dealing with complex problems. And so where do inter and transdisciplinarity fit? Um, that's the focus of um, the work that you're doing here. Um, what, they're one of many different ways for dealing with complex problems. And the terms inter and transdisciplinarity have many meanings. Um, not all of them are related to dealing with complex problems. And so the, the kinds of inter and transdisciplinarity I'm going to focus on here are the kinds that tackle complex societal and environmental problems, the kinds that bring together perspectives from multiple and diverse disciplines, so not disciplines that are closely aligned like physics and chemistry, but disciplines that are much further apart, that engage with stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean people who are affected by the problem, and people who are in a position to do something about the problem, people in government, business, civil society. And I'm going to start by asking the question, what if we brought all the different ways of dealing with complex societal and environmental problems together? And the framework or the discipline that I've um, developed, Integration and Implementation Sciences, really aims to do that. It aims to underpin all these different approaches that I've talked about and find a way of bringing the, 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 the best of all of those to bear on complex problems. 
So this is a um, an overview, a one pager of the of the framework. Um, you're not going to be able to read this. Um, I'm going to take you through it in more detail. Um, there is a reference at the bottom if you're interested. Um, so Integration and Implementation Sciences is a repository of uh, research and education tools. That's where it starts. It aims to overcome the fragmentation that I talked about to bring together all the different approaches and it aims to systematically build expertise. Um, it offers a framework for building expertise, it, which has three components. The first is to understand problems and potential actions more comprehensively. The second is to support policy and practice improvement, so to support government and business and civil society in doing better. And in order to do that, we have to be able to interact effectively. It also acknowledges that we can never have perfect solutions, so that imperfection is inevitable. But there are, as I said earlier, ways that we can do things that are better than others. So we're always looking for best possible outcomes. So let's start with the first of these, a more comprehensive understanding. What needs to be taken into account? And again, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about the sorts of things that you think we would need to think about when we want to um, understand problems and potential actions more comprehensively. So what did you come up with? Um, I'm going to suggest that there are five different things. The first is we've got to understand that problems are systems. The second is we've got to understand that they exist in a particular context. So what happens in one country, for example, is different from what happens in another country. We've got to understand that there's always going to be a lot that we don't know and we need to be able to deal with that. We need to understand diversity, that different people think about these problems in different ways and want to do different things about them. And we need to find ways of integrating the diversity, bringing diverse perspectives together. I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail later in the talk. So let's think about the second element, which is uh, supporting policy and practice improvement. Again, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about the sorts of things that you think need to be taken into account. You might think about these a bit, not in kind of the big picture headings, but you might think about them in more granular detail, more fine detail. Um, and hopefully as the talk goes on, you'll see whether what you're thinking fits within the framework that I'm going to present. Okay, so the things that I think are important is to understand how decision making works, to understand how you can get research implemented into policy and practice change, and we need to understand change itself. So how does change work? Um, if we want to influence change, we need to understand it. And then finally, interacting effectively. Again, what do you think needs to be taken into account here? So here I'm going to talk about three things again, communication. So we need to be able to communicate effectively. We need to be able to work together in teams effectively. And we need to work with those who are affected by the problem or those who are in a position to change the problem, so-called stakeholders. We need to be able to do that effectively. So this is the framework. And what I'm going to do now is to take you through the framework but also to show you a bunch of tools um, for dealing with these different elements. And again, as I said, I'm hoping that as you've thought about the different elements that I've asked you to think about, um, as we go through it now, that you'll be able to see where what you think fits. So the resource that I'm going to talk about is Integration and Implementation Insights or I2 Insights. This is both a blog and a repository. So by blog, I mean it's um, something that people contribute to and that those contributions are kept in a repository for anybody to access. 
The focus of I2 Insights is on tools, so it focuses on concepts, methods, processes, frameworks. It tries to cover all elements of the expertise that I talked about earlier. It covers new things that people have come up with, new tools, but it also covers what I call golden oldies, so ones that have been around for a long time and have really proved their worth. The aim of um, an I2 Insights contribution is to be short and easy to read. And the aim of I2 Insights is that it is a global resource so that people from all over the world contribute and read it. At the moment, we're doing pretty well on reading. So we're read in 191 of the 193 countries that comprise the United Nations. We've still got a little way to go in terms of contributions. So we have contributions from 55 countries in the world. Um, so clearly there's still another 140 or 138 to go. Um, and I'm always looking for new contributions and hope that you might think about contributing when the time is right as well. So let me start by introducing you to the website. It's a very long home page. And at the top of the home page, you'll find the latest contribution. So there's a new contribution published every week, except for a two to three week break over the Christmas period. Um, you can find what there is through both a search and an advanced search function. And if you're interested in getting an email every week to tell you what the latest contribution is, then there's a way of subscribing um, that I hope you might think about doing. A bit further down the page, you find the contributions for the last four weeks. So this only shows two of them. But so there's the most recent contribution at the top um, or the latest contribution at the top, then four recent contributions. And you can also over here find uh, comments that people have made on the contributions, which um, are also listed underneath each contribution. And then a little bit further down the page, we re-advertise um, blog posts that were published a couple of years ago, and these are under highlighted contributions. So on the, if you just look at the home page, you'll get um, nine different blog posts, and that in itself will give you a, an indication of the diversity of what is published and how it covers all the different elements of integration and implementation insights. So let's start with systems. Um, so systems has been around for more than 100 years as a recognisable field. Unfortunately, it's splintered into multiple groups. So system dynamics, critical systems thinking, community operational research and a whole bunch more. Most importantly, taking a systems approach requires thinking about multiple interacting cause and effect relationships. So it's not just this causes this, but this causes this and that and that causes this and that. And so you've got all these interactions. Um, if you think about a map with um, sometimes like people think about it like a bowl of spaghetti where everything's connected to everything else. The second is that we have to set because it's everything's connected to everything else. We have to set some boundaries around what will be investigated. Um, and so that's an, um, an artificial process. There are no real boundaries in the world. Everything is connected to everything else. But if we want to deal with the problem effectively, we have to determine what boundaries we're going to set. We also have to appreciate that a part of a system is also a system, so that systems are made up of other systems and every, so there's this complex interrelationship of systems in, in themselves. And something I'll be coming back to quite a lot is that different people have different perspectives and so that will influence how the system is investigated and how the problem is understood. So some examples from I2 Insights. Um, the first two examples are really about problems. So the first one is by Gerald Midgley. And if you don't read anything else in systems thinking, I suggest you read Gerald's work. He's really one of the most influential systems thinkers. So this is a, these two blog posts are about if you ignore systems thinking, you're in trouble. So Gerald talks about the fact that you can't work with other people effectively uh, to co-create something without thinking about systems thinking. And Pashu Lay thinks about, says that 
just raising awareness of a problem doesn't fix it, right? You have to think about the problem systemically and you have to think about what the cause and effect issues are that you can influence. Um, Helena Gomez is here with you um, and she's done this lovely piece of work on, on a framework using uh, Eleanor Ostrom's socio-ecological systems framework. And this last one is also about, a, uh, is about combining frameworks. So this is a group of researchers from Iran and the Netherlands and they've put together a bunch of different systems thinking frameworks to deal with a problem and in the process create shared value. So what I'm trying to do with these, so for every topic I'm going to show you four examples and um, I'm going to, I've picked things that are quite diverse to give you a flavour of the variety that's available and hopefully to get you to uh, be interested to read some of what there is. So let's move on to context. So the circumstances in which a problem occurs affects what's researched and how, and it affects which actions are contemplated and what happens. So there are three main kinds of context. The first of these is what I call big picture context. So this is the historical context, political context, the economics, the geography, the culture, all of these big things that influence how a problem occurs and what can be done. The second is the structure and culture of the organisations that are involved in doing the research and taking the action. So um, a research organisation that has no social scientists won't be very good at dealing with the social science aspects of a problem, for example. And the culture of an organisation, do people have lunch together? Do they not talk to each other? Does everybody walk at home, work at home? Um, is also going to be quite important in determining what do, what's done and what can happen. And the third kind of context is the individual context. So each of us, um, it's sometimes thought of as positionality. So it's what do we bring together, uh, bring to bear. So what are our own, our own life experiences? Um, what do we know? What do we not know? Where are our blind spots? All of those things influence how a problem is researched and understood and then what actions are taken. So to give you some examples, this is a classic from um, the Global South, particularly uh, Latin America, thinking about how to bridge knowledge and policy. And they've got a great framework that I'd invite you to go and have a look at. The way that we talk, the language also really influences how we understand a problem. So Ch Chalini Ramwala from Sri Lanka has looked at three different languages that are used in Sri Lanka and how you communicate in those languages is completely different. And um, so the, if you think about newspapers, for example, they look completely different. The colour scheme is different. The print that's used is different. And so if we want to be effective in working in different contexts, we have to understand that culture matters. Another example of culture matters is this work from Brazil and India, looking at how interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work occur in those countries. And again, the cultural differences. And finally, an important part of culture is place, so geography. And there's a lovely blog post um, by Alexandra Crosby and Ilaria Yani about how to understand place and more effectively look at how place can influence what we do. So then let's move on to the third element, which is the unknown. It's important to understand that the unknown is vast and it's, there's various different kinds of unknowns. And the unknowns aren't all bad. There are good po positive aspects of unknowns as well. You might have come across this before. There are known knowns, known unknowns. So what we know, we don't know. There's what we don't know, we know. And then there's what we don't know, we don't know, which is unknown unknowns. And if you just look at known unknowns, so what we don't, what we know that we don't know, different disciplines and different stakeholders inherently focus on different known unknowns. So what physics looks at is different from what immunology looks at or sociology 
what a banker looks at is different from what a politician looks at. So the way that we think about, the way that we work inherently as people and as academics, if we've got a disciplinary background, we will inherently focus on different kinds of known unknowns. There are uh, six common ways of uh, getting rid of unknowns. So there's reduction, putting it to one side, banishment, accepting it, dealing with it. Um, each of these are really interesting <laughs> and I could spend a long time talking about them. And each of them can be a positive way of dealing with the unknown and each of them can be a negative way. So they can be adaptive or maladaptive. It's also important to note that unknowns are essential for creativity and freedom, but they're also a source of major adverse unintended consequences. So there's a vast amount to explore in the area of um, unknowns. There's some great work that's been done by Mike Smithson, a, a colleague of mine, um, from whom I learned most of what I know about the unknown. Um, so he's uh, looked at four things that everybody should know, and I've talked about some of those already. There's some great work on accountability. So if you, you can be accountable for some things that you know about, but you cannot be accountable for unknown unknowns. Um, unknown unknowns, I guess, is an area that um, we've, we've run a series of blog posts on, and, and this post by Bemla Hunt um, looks at how we protect ourselves from unknown unknowns, why we don't want to face up to them, why they're so difficult. And then another speaker who you'll recognise um, from having been on shortly before me, Rick Stozak, has thought about how we can use cross-disciplinary interactions to illuminate, to understand what we don't know we don't know. So then let's move on to diversity. And I'm going to start with this primer that I've developed because it really outlines um, a lot of what we don't, don't think about in diversity. So often we think about diversity as being gender diversity, differences in age, um, uh, you know, differences in ability. But it's also important to think about the things that are listed here. So mental models, different disciplines think what makes good research is different, differences in power, differences in values, interests, culture, personalities. And if we're working together, there are also different team roles that people normally play. So again, one of the speakers um, here, Bin Bin Pierce, has done some great work with Oliver Erdjan about looking at how do we bring together diversity on to look at how we frame the problems. And they've developed a great framework for doing that. Um, and then Indigenous knowledge is also an important aspect of diversity. So thinking about not only Western knowledge, not only stakeholder knowledge and local knowledge, but also about Indigenous knowledge and how do we bring all these different kinds of knowledge together? How do we respect them? How do we make the most of them? The important thing about diversity is that it enriches what we do. So understanding how a range of people think about something enriches, makes how we understand things much more complex and also much more interesting, but it also makes working together a lot harder. So the fact, if you have a group of people um, working together who all think the same, they're going to have a much easier time of it than people who think very differently and who have to not only understand those differences, but find ways of accommodating them. One of the reasons for that is that we, what we want to do to get a more complex or a richer understanding of a problem is we want to harness the diversity to develop a more comprehensive understanding or a new understanding or new solutions. Um, even though these solutions are never permanent, they're only ever part-time and temporary, they are only better ways of doing things, we want to bring together different sets of ideas so that we can think about a problem better and that we can find better ways forward. So some interesting ways of doing that are to synthesize different um, perspectives. We can sometimes also balance them in particular ways. And there are various ways of doing that. So one is dialogue, so talking to each other. 
Um, trying to develop something together, so building something together, like building a model together or building a shared product of some sort together, building an electric car together, for example. Um, so in Australia, we have a solar car race and students from different disciplines are brought together to build a solar car. It's a great integrative mechanism um, using a common metric. So converting everything into a dollar value is a synthetic tool. And there are theories that can help us do this as well. Good integration requires time. It, advise, it requires the ability to go around and around and iterate. It requires the ability to think about what we're doing. And it also requires recognition that everything isn't going to be able to be integrated. You're always going to have things that don't quite fit. And you have, there'll be some things that don't fit at all. So, there's this lovely uh, blog post from a, a, a group of Australian, Swiss and uh, Americans who have thought about the complexity of transdisciplinary integration. Um, there's some lovely work by Anna Marie Horn and Eduardo Urias on thinking on, on trying to teach students how to integrate. And they find that students very rarely know how to integrate. They really have to be taught it. So students often think it's like a puzzle and everything will just fit together. Or they think that their view is the only view that's important. Or they think that they'll listen to everybody else's view but never inject their own view. So those are all three ways in which integration can go wrong. And what you need to do is you need to um, understand that it's not just a, a neat puzzle that where things will fit together. You need to listen, but you also need to insert your own perspective and then there has to be a way of bringing all of that together. Bringing together art and science is a great uh, way of thinking about the importance of integration and, and Dia Ahmadian from Egypt has done some terrific work in bringing art and science together. Uh, there are some really in interesting installations. I'd recommend looking at that. And then Howard Gardner from Harvard has really been thinking about, so there are all these different ways of integrating. Can we put them into a taxonomy? And he's both written a book on this, but has also written a blog post that, again, I'd recommend. So then let's move on to uh, supporting policy and practice improvement in government, business and civil society. And the first element there, which is decision making. So. Some of you will have heard of fast and slow thinking. So most decisions we make using fast thinking or rules of thumb, or they're also called heuristics. So we don't have to think a lot about what we're going to put on in the morning. We don't have to think a lot about it, a whole range of decisions that we make throughout the day. But for complex problems, we need to not just do things <laughs> that seem intuitively good. We actually need to have a much more rational and deliberative process. We need to think very carefully about what we're going to do. So this involves focusing on defining the problem. So we've got to think carefully about how we define the problem. And you might remember I said at the beginning that people don't, one of the things about these kinds of problems is that people don't agree on the definition. So you've got to find something that will work for a diverse group of people to come together on. We have to, in terms of uh, making decisions, have think about what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to measure performance. We have to think about different alternatives. So it's not just looking for one way forward. It's looking for a range of ways forward. We have to look at the consequences of each of those alternatives. And then we have to evaluate trade-offs. So this is better than that in this and this and this dimension. But that is better than this when it comes to X and Y, right? So you've always got to think about, so what's what's an alternative better than another alternative for? What's it worse for? And then you've got to think about, so what's the best decision we can make in these circumstances? We've also got to think about our cognitive biases. So we've all got cognitive biases. Um, they're things like looking for what we believe in rather than looking at what's there. The possibility of think, groupthink, so when you're in a group, everybody thinks the same. Um, and we've got to think about improbable but high consequence events, uh, so-called black swans. Um, and there's a, a famous book by Nicholas Taleb about that. So then 
decision making tools vary from the quite simple to the much more complex. So this is neat uh, facilitation tool which Hannah Love has written about called Gradients of Agreement. So rather than just um, not listening to a group properly and just assuming that everybody agrees, you can get everybody to vote. There are methods that people can use, like the Delphi method, um, which is a particular way of getting experts to make decisions based on their expertise. You can use things like scenarios um, to think about future decisions. So scenarios are kind of what if, what if the future looked like this? What if the future looked like that? And looking that to influence your decisions. And then modeling is a common tool for decision making. And there's a, a, a great, piece of work that I had the good fortune to be involved with with, with Andrea Saltelli, um, looking at what models, <coughs> excuse me, looking at, at, at what we need to do to make modelling more effective. So then if we're doing a whole lot of work, research work, we also want it to be taken into account when decisions get made. So how do we do that? So research implementation is about helping people assess the value of evidence. It's about figuring out where it would be useful to inform decision making in government or business or civil society. So which of those do you choose and where in government do you take it to the Department of Health or do you take it to the Prime Minister's Department or do you take it to the Treasury? And then you've got to figure out how to best make the evidence available to the relevant people in government, business or civil society. You need to understand how policy and practice changes are formulated. You need to understand the role of evidence in those processes and you need to improve people's ability to appreciate what evidence is strong in and what it's weak in and for a particular piece of evidence what are the strengths and weaknesses of that evidence. It's important to remember that research is only one factor in making comp decisions about complex practice problems. And if you want to be effective, you need to understand the realities of who is who you are trying to influence, um, who you're trying to get to change and, and how you get to those people. So um, this is a, a piece of work about trying to change behaviour about uh, in civil society in, in uh, a bunch of countries about uh, reducing um, nematode infections in children and they used a cartoon video as a way of achieving research impact. Um, the next ones that I'm going to look at are all about influencing policy making. A lot of uh, researcher effort goes into thinking about how do we do that better. So this is from an earlier career researcher, Aparna Lal, thinking about, so how do I, what's, what are some tips for, what did she learn as an early career researcher to influence policy making, government policy making? When you were doing it in the Global South, there are a whole bunch of challenges, including how do you deal with governments that are corrupt or not particularly competent. And there's this uh, lovely blog post from Indonesia, from Hariji Segar. And then a similar sort of work from Africa, thinking about how do we, in transdisciplinary research, how do we um, get science policy interactions to work more effectively and looking at um, a whole range of issues, including what they call the last mile problem. So not running out of steam just at the end of the process. So then let's move on to change. Um, I, changes, like unknowns, change is one of those areas that I find really fascinating um, because to make change happen, you've really got to understand that these processes, that, that anything that's changed, is there's, there are multiple things that are happening. It's unpredictable. It's always changing. It's dynamic. And if you want to make change happen, you've got to think about, so I need to strengthen this. I need to make this group weaker. I need to help these people interact. There are a whole lot of these um, interactors. Again, it's like systems think. It is systems thinking, right? You've got to, you've got to think about the system and how you, inf how you influence the system. So, and 
you've got to think about what is it we're trying to achieve and the desired outcome is inherently value based. It doesn't mean it's everybody's idea of change is, is good. Um, some people's idea of change is, is very strongly um, based on very strong values. Some people's idea is, is much weaker um, in terms of what some of us would think of as good values. So they might be motivated by money or power or, um, uh, or things that are not necessarily good for society. So as I said at the beginning, systems change occurs at many scales and you've got to think about what happens to individuals, organisations, societies and the environment. So you've got to look at systems change at multiple scales. You've got to understand that there are different ways that you influence change. So incentives are always a good way to influence change. Exerting power is also effective in influencing change. And you've got to think about what are the different ways that you can use to make change happen. There are different uh, disciplinary and stakeholder perspectives on change and each of them is only partial or lim and limited. So again, the way that a, a, a physicist thinks about change and a biologist thinks about change and a sociologist thinks about change and a politician thinks about change are all very different. And they've all got a piece of understanding that's important, but none of them has an overall view. Um, there's a lot of thinking now about developing a theory of change, and that provides a really good starting point for appreciating the complexities of change. But a theory of change alone is not enough. So again, let's look at a bunch of I2 Insights contribution, uh, starting with a theory of change by Helen Clark. Uh, so this is a, a, a quick overview if you're curious about how theory of change works. This is some nice work by Katia Jaeger, who's looked at how can you use a civil society organisation and how can you work with your volunteers to make change more likely to happen. This is a great piece of work that David Lamb has been involved in, um, thinking about not only change but also the the transformative change so really making change happen so if you've had a small change how can you make that into a big change and and in this blog post they outline eight different ways of scaling up change and then there are again systems approaches and and daniel marine vanagas is hiding uh, in this picture um but again this is a great model for thinking about how to make change happen. So then let's move on to interacting effectively. So an important part of that is just being able to communicate. And just is, is probably a word that shouldn't be there. So being able to communicate is a really important part of interacting effectively. And communication is about formal and informal methods of engaging with others. And you need to be able to do it in a variety of settings. You need to be able to use various media and you need to understand cultural norms. So you will remember one of the blog posts I talked about um, different, different language groups within one society, different things, different ways of communicating with them will work differently. The key purposes of communication are not only to give information, but also to receive it. It's also about forming and maintaining relationships and communication, communication is also important for gaining or exerting power. And you need a bunch of skills. So you need to understand how to frame a message. You need to understand how to make it work for the audience that you're speaking to. It helps if you're a good storyteller. It helps if you're able to listen uh, really well. It helps if you're able to facilitate so that everybody's included. And it helps if you can be familiar with some formal dialogue processes. So there are processes like nominal group, te group technique. There are processes like the Delphi method, which I mentioned earlier. So there are a whole range of um, both formal and informal ways of making communication more effective. So this is um, a nice piece of work which provides 10 communication tips going over some of what I've said and some other ones. Um, often when we can't come to an integrated position, we think that it might be that, we, that our positions are incommensurable, which means that they don't fit together. 
But what Vincenzo Poletti talks about is that it could just be that you're not communicating well and he tries to tease apart what is it that means that something doesn't fit together versus whether you're just not able to communicate properly with each other. Um, Yuko Onishi from Japan has done some lovely thinking about patterns. So pattern language or patterns are about communicating the things that aren't, they're not quite methods yet, but they're kind of rules of thumb for doing something. And she's developed a bunch of those um, for that are useful for inter and transdisciplinarity. And um, you can use games as another effective way of communicating. So you can play a game together. So this is serious games, not um, <laughs> not the kind of fun games that we do for entertainment, but you can look at um, what might happen in a particular location if you make a particular change. You can model that and then you can turn the model into a game and you can bring all the people who are affected by the change into the room to play the game. And that's a great way of helping them to communicate with each other and to understand each other better. So then move on to teamwork. Um, so teamwork um, I use to cover many different kinds of cooperation and collaboration. It's important to understand that there are some general principles that apply to all teamwork and two important principles are that you have to build trust and you have to build a shared vision. Teamwork in, involves being able to work with the diverse perspectives and skills of team members. So the whole point is bringing diversity together and you need to work with that. You need to have good processes for forming teams. You need to have good ongoing support for teams. There are a whole bunch of team dynamics that people understand that you need to be able to manage. You need to understand that. And you're going to get disagreement. If you don't get disagreement, there's, <laughs> there's something wrong. You don't have enough diversity in the, in the team. So disagreement's not a problem. It's when it, what you have to do is you have to make that productive. You have to make disagreement a learning opportunity. So everybody goes, oh, is that what you think? Well, maybe, you know, and then you everybody has a, a deeper understanding as a result of the disagreement. And for teamwork to work effectively, you've got to have good leadership and you've got to have good facilitation. So you've got to be able to bring people together to work together effectively. And you've got to have a bunch of tools that help overcome the challenges of teamwork. So one of the effective th things to do is to develop a collaboration agreement template. So this is about setting expectations when you start on teamwork. So how are we going to work together? Um, facilitation skills and leadership work together hand in hand. So leaders, facilitators and leaders can be different people but it's really helpful for leaders to have a bunch of facilitation skills and Manala Farah has written about how to do that. Um, what I said right at the beginning is interdisciplinarity and the science of team science are two different ways of, that people have developed for dealing with complexity and Susie Spitzer brings some ideas together here for how, what they can learn for each other, which is really what um, integration and implementation sciences is trying to do is to bring everything together. And then you can also learn a lot from the, the rituals and practices in particular cultures. So this is Ra Smith, um, who's a Māori from, from New Zealand, and he talks about a particular process that New Zealand Māori use to welcome people and to work together with them. And there are a whole lot of elements of that that, that work really well in a whole range of other cultures as well. So then let's move on finally to stakeholder engagement. Um, as I've said earlier, stakeholders are two groups, those who are affected by the problem that we're investigating and those who are in a position to do something about the problem and they'll usually be in government or in business or in civil society and maybe you need to bring all three groups together. We need to understand um, how to identify relevant stakeholders and select who to participate. We need to employ appropriate forms of interaction. And what's appropriate depends a lot on who the stakeholders are and what their circumstances are. 
So the way that you would involve a homeless person is different from the way that you would involve the head of a government department. And you need to have a range of um, methods at your disposal for doing that. So there are different methods. Informing is a kind of stakeholder engagement, consulting, co-producing something together, co-producing, or you can support what the stakeholders want to do. So they can be the lead people, and as a researcher, you can be the supportive person. So again, there's a primer. Um, my aim is to develop primers for all of the different elements of integration and implementation insights but I've only managed two so far, the one on diversity and the one on stakeholder engagement. Um, and it has 10 components, which you can uh, read here, most of which I've already talked about. Um, there are some terrific tools. Um, there's a listening-based dialogue tool that's been developed. This is a group from Bolivia. Um, really interesting um, set of principles for working together, particularly with Indigenous communities. Um, and uh, Australian Aboriginal group who've also thought about how do you work, how can um, Westerners work more effectively with Aboriginal Indigenous communities. So that's the, the tools that are available in the um, I2 Insights repository. The repository is not just about providing tools, it's also about building a global community. Um, the idea is that we exchange, that we learn, and that we strengthen um, the tools and the communities, that we um, look at what other people are using. And one of the reasons for developing the repository was because the tools are so widely scattered. And what I wanted to do was to have one place where you can find an array of tools. <clears throat> so there's obviously, excuse me, <clears throat> Obviously not everything's there, but we've got um, over 500 tools and you get a, a, an idea of the breadth of what can help you deal more effectively with complex problems. So I'm going to invite you to do some homework. So please, sometime during the course of this course, um, please find one blog post that you're interested in and read it and make a comment. One of the ways of building community is to, is to comment on other people's blog posts. Um, you'll go, your comment will go into moderation, but I'll try to deal with it as quickly as I can so that it goes live. It would be great to have to start a bunch of conversations going as a result of this course. A different way of building community, so I'm going to take off my integration and implementation sciences hat and put on my global alliance for inter and transdisciplinarity hat. I've recently become the president of this global alliance. And again, we're trying to build a community. And I'd invite you to think about joining the alliance, joining alliance activities. You can do a lot of things without being a member as well as uh, becoming a member. And I'd really invite you to get involved in um, Global Alliance for Inter- and Transdisciplinarity Activities. And if you want to find out more about any of this, um, there are a couple of websites. Uh, there's a LinkedIn group. We have a number of videos on YouTube. Um, I'm still on X. <laughs> and you can also feel free to email me. I'm, um, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to join you and to listen to, to just have a discussion with you. Um, if the technology works, this recording is uh, this recording has been made in case the technology is not working. Um, so I'm going to hope for the best. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you think. I'm really looking forward to reading your comments on I2Insights. And thank you very much for the opportunity.